In the world of science fiction, mind control is a recurring theme. However, whenever we step away from the realm of science fiction and look at reality as it is today, we can find real world examples that are taking us step by step closer to that inevitable outcome. Now I'd be lying if I said I wasn't pretty worried about where this path is going, but I see it as basically an inevitable future. So in this video, I'm going to just sort of tackle it from a few different angles so I can show you how like multiple paths are kind of converging on this outcome. So first we'll build on the concept of a metaverse like 3.0, like a two more generations down the road. Like what is that going to feel like to our brain and our senses? And we're going to look at some of the unified walking designs that can talk seamlessly with the environment created in virtual reality like this one that Disney Imagineers have just released. And with this kind of a technology sort of working in prototype phase and some of the technology coming out of Apple and Meta for headsets, it's easy to connect the dots. Now another example is a company that's working on generative 3D artificial intelligence with, get this, mind control for lucid dreaming by putting electrical signals into the brain in a non-invasive way, but shooting electricity into the brain in exactly the same frequency that would resonate for a lucid dream, affecting your dreams, making them lucid every night you go to sleep with this device on your head. What the heck is going on? A headband that induces lucid dreaming because AI can be created building a neural network that instead of going from like text to text, like chat GPT, goes from the waves that you can detect on EEGs to other waves that you can detect on EEGs and then generates them is not something that was on my radar at all. And I'm in the AI space a lot. This is really a unique use case of AI. Just the thought of being able to wake someone up to consciousness or to control in a dream, but not waking them up out of the dream, being like a real possibility that I now believe is an inevitable future is just sort of crazy. And I'm just imagining how the sum of all the parts are going to become much greater than the parts themselves. And we're gonna be shocked that big tech figured out mind control. I can walk on this omnidirectional floor in any direction I want. So if this new flooring system, this uh, sort of marble or rolling based, completely dynamic resistance creating in the fly based on the environment that you have from the headset is works at all at this point and will definitely work a few generations down the road, we have a totally different way of walking around and experiencing the metaverse. This is totally needed. This is what you need to go from something that's just weird and you have to stay in place and you're in the living room that doesn't feel right to something that's closer to the Star Trek style holodeck. And if metaverse graphics continue at any pace that they are now, we're gonna have completely real realistic 3D graphics in every direction. We're going to have the logic based on an AI system to make it so you, when you move around and you move your body, you're feeling as though you're walking around in that environment. And that is such a different computational paradigm than anything we have seen before. And it's not even going to take a redesign of everything. I mean, this technology needs to be refined, but I'm guessing that something like a future version of Unreal Engine will still have all of the tools that it has for every other part of building video games, and they can just plug this in. And the fact that everything's standing in the way of a surface like this truly working and making it feel completely real when you're inside a video game is doable with the right kind of engineering, and there's companies that are sufficiently motivated to keep innovating on these, like Disney and Apple and Meta, this is for sure gonna happen. Okay, so imagine that component, something like Unreal Engine creating the environment, and then add another component to video game engines also being AI driven in what they show you. Okay, so what I mean by that is that right now you might imagine video games working a lot like uh, a first person shooter or a sports game or whatever it is, as a storyline or a narrative, like a movie that you kind of walk through, but you get choices, you sort of get independent controls of how to move around pre-built environments. But I'm talking about something where it's much more like real life in the sense that there is no completely planned video game for you. In fact, the algorithm that makes the video game might be extremely small. It itself could be trained from a learning system that learns to adapt to whatever it is that you want to experience, whatever makes sense for what's going on in your narrative, and it's completely different in all aspects for everybody who plays it. 
So imagine standing on something like that Disney flooring that we saw, putting on something like an Apple uh, Vision headset, something that immerses you in sound and feeling and environment, but the environment is not created until the second and the moment you turn on that system, right? So you plug it in and you get something like a prompt, a Siri, Cortana, an Alexa, something, and you say, uh, put me in a warehouse and make me a video game where I'm a dragon or something. And then boom, you're like in a warehouse, in a dragon, and the story just goes. Now, if you don't like it, you're like, hey, I, this warehouse was stupid. Uh, put me on a pile of gold and make it more like Lord of the Rings. Boom, you're there. But now it's like, make me a space dragon, put it on the moon and make it like a tech thing and make me like the underdog and I need to fight off these even bigger dragons that fly through space and eat planets or whatever it is. It just happens. Like it's just your imagination, like a dream coming to life. And even though this seems way out there, it's sort of the conclusion that you get to when you watch stuff that Mark Zuckerberg is saying about the future of the company like this. In this post, he's saying to fulfill the vision that we have for AI and the metaverse, we need to build this super cluster, this huge computational learning system that can generate models, AI models, like it's kind of similar to ChatGPT, but we're not talking about just words and tokens. We're talking about a lot of multimodal ways of like putting data in and getting data out, but still building them in that learning way. I mean, he's, he says it from a technical point of view in this video because he's talking about how they need 600,000 graphics cards, these H100 graphics cards from NVIDIA, which are meant for training AI systems. But what he's basically saying there is that we need to create this huge digital brain and we need to put tons of data into it so that we can learn a specialized model that can generate things on the fly. And in the metaverse, that means 3D environments. So after you have this uh, kind of environmental thing, like the floor, the gloves, the glasses, all of that stuff to take your senses into the metaverse. And you have a metaverse that's created on the fly from a learning algorithm. Then we also need to think about just how this first person shift to a digital environment starts to take away our control in the first place. If the system itself can generate anything on the fly and it's learned from all the other people who have generated things on the fly and then it's watched and learned from our reaction, which is essentially training data on how well we enjoyed the experience or what we really want, what when we say we want something, what really actually makes us happy and what doesn't, it's going to start to learn to be the boss, to be the alpha, to be the creator and we become the follower even though we think we're guiding it, it's so smart. It's guiding us in ways that we don't understand, but we ask for more. And in that that way, we become controlled, I would say. If you didn't go back in time, people put on TV shows and the TV shows competed for viewers and the ones that got the most viewers got renewed and the ones that didn't got canceled. And in some ways, the audience was always telling Hollywood what kind of content to produce and Hollywood would take their best guesses and see how it would do. And there was kind of a feedback system that got super amplified by social media to the point where now like millions of pieces of content go up, the algorithm catches a few, people click on some things, they don't click on others, stuff that's not clicked on gets dead. It's all just sometimes content driving us, sometimes us driving content, but it's sort of symbiotic in the way it works. What I'm arguing for in this video is that the tipping point crosses over at some point, especially in this metaverse environment, and we completely lose control. The system will always be better at giving us what we want than we can tell it. Or in some cases, maybe we guide it a little bit, but 99% of the time it's in the driver's seat. And that means that a company like Meta or whoever controls this metaverse experience, the advertisers, whatever it is, they have the potential to use superhuman thinking and environmental factors to persuade us to believe and do things. The idea of being manipulated for even our own best interest or good is going to be normalized, but you can certainly nudge that manipulation towards the best interests of profitable companies. And when it becomes that immersive, it becomes intertwined in the way that our brain is forming in the first place. So when we take off these goggles and get off this digital Disney you know, flooring system and we walk around in real life, so many deep memories from the metaverse experience will be sort of processing and populating and when we go to bed at night be kind of absorbed and put into our long-term memory that there will be some of it in us in our deep personality forever. Speaking of dreams, there's lucid dreaming headbands that are being created right now and who knows where that's gonna lead. In one sense, I would love to go to bed at night and lucid dream and get back to work and grow and learn and experience things, but also, maybe I need to sleep and turn off and let those memories fade 
away. Maybe we shouldn't be messing with our dreams. It'll make us crazy or something. Who knows? But look, man, the fact is some company's creating this headband now. And in principle, it seems like it would work. I don't know if this is the right company, how well it works. I've not put one of these headbands on. I don't even think they're totally available yet for consumers. But I do have this hunch that when you're dreaming and when you're awake, there's a lot more similarities than you'd think on first uh, approximation because the reality that we live in now to some degree is sort of dreamed up. It's confabulated. We've talked about split brain patients before. We've talked about how the brain doesn't really like rewind and replay memories as it does sort of recreate them from the patterns in our brain. And part of me wonders that when we're awake and we're present and we're in real life with real people doing real things, it's a lot of dreaming with strict rules. The universe works a certain way. We've grown up our whole lives from the environmental learning data, seeing that some things are stable, gravity works, shadows are cast, uh, people act in certain ways. We exist in this environment where we need to like, you know, get food, things like that. So the fact that it has such physical rules might be why it's a little different from dreaming, where it is in dreaming, you can kind of just imagine and things go off into Crazyville because there's nothing to like constrain them. But maybe when you're awake, there's just a lot more constraints and that's essentially the difference. And of course there's way more to it than that because in physical world, we actually move our bodies around. We're organisms in like an environment that actually has real repercussions and cause and effect and all of that stuff. But that's where I think about, you know, devices like this that are being built. It's called the Morpheus One. If they can generate lucid dreaming, while we're in our dream, could they also start to induce simulations of the physics that make our world our awaking world, could they tap into, um, say, like an online video game or some sort of metaverse environment and bring those people into your dream by creating the right brainwaves and making you feel like you're there. And all of a sudden, it's actually connected to the real metaverse because your decisions in your dream are recorded by this device. And this device sends digital information up to the metaverse about like where you should be positioned and what you're saying and what you're doing and relaying that stuff back into you. And now you're awake in the metaverse? Kind of? Get out of here, that's crazy. And I don't exactly know how well this device is gonna work. It's got a million and three um, parameters on its neural network. So it's like realistically compared to these big companies, incredibly small, but if it works, that technology can certainly get better. Um, you can read electrical signals through the brain. We can learn what electrical signals mean certain things from EEGs and fMRIs. And it's really easy to put a battery in a headband like this and generate electrical signals too. And if those can, you know, fire at the right frequencies in the right parts of your brain, then I think it really could result in dreams. Now, getting the feedback from somebody asleep seems kind of hard, but not impossible. By stabilizing and inducing lucid dreams, we will pursue the answers to life's biggest questions. So if you're freaking out kind of like me, I don't blame you, but I do have some good news. Lucky for us, the United Nations Human Rights Council has approved a new resolution called Neurotechnology and Human Rights. And it's an important piece of legislation for the entire world to start thinking about because it's designed to safeguard people from technologies capable of, quote, recording, altering, or influencing brain activity. I don't really sort of lean towards free market solutions for a lot of things, and I like companies working on this technology with the incentive of profit to some degree. But when we see companies trying to maximize profits, especially when it comes to selling data or controlling data, there's been privacy concerns in the past that we're already kind of stepping over what I'm comfortable with. But if you get into the brain, it's really clearly an invasion of privacy super quickly. So I like that this document uses terms such as cognitive engineering, mental privacy, cognitive liberty, to try to put some definitions around these potential hazards. And honestly, any kind of mind control, even if it's ethical or it's like your data is encrypted or the person, the consumer themselves chose to put this device on their head, but it goes up to the cloud and some other company has to manage that. It just raises a lot of questions about uh, on the philosophical end, like free will and on the practical end, privacy. I recommend that you use a collection of those electrical signals in your brain to hit that subscribe button right now. Thank you to Rob, who is my first Patreon to give me $100 a month. That means so much to me because uh, I would love to make this channel profitable. I've been working at it for like a year now and I've not had the success that I hoped for. So uh, little bits of uh, just donation like that are just super valuable to me. So Rob, thank you so much. And everybody else, those subscribes really help. My next goal is 10,000 subscribers. I'm gonna have a big party. It'll be really fun. I'll make a video about it. So hit that button, smash that button and I'll see you guys in the next video.